I am Dr. Sridhar. I have covered a few important topics as tutorial format. Now, I will be discussing perinatal asphyxia. So, uh, the baby is supported by the placenta and obviously the placenta is part of the uterus. When the mother is going through the labor process, the uterus muscle is contracting. The blood supply to the placenta comes from the uterine artery as well and when the uterus muscle is contracting, the blood flow to the placenta reduces. So, most of you are familiar with CTG or cardiotocogram monitoring where we review the fetal heart rate with the uterine contractions and you know that there is a physiologic drop in the fetal heart rate, uh, the type 1 desilarations which can happen uh, or with cord compressions as well. So, most of the babies who are healthy can tolerate these uh, drops in blood supply and uh, the oxygenation of the baby even though it drops the baby is geared up to cope with that. There are some situations either because of the labor process being prolonged or because there is an accident in nature like a cord prolapse, uh, abruption where the placenta separates from the wall of the uterus, the mother loses excess blood, the mother has a low blood pressure or the fetus is not normal, um, baby is growth restricted already, the blood vessels supplying the baby from the placenta are already small because of maternal hypertension or so on, the baby has infection which affects the ability of the baby to cope. So, if these factors are there the, or the labor process is very prolonged, the uterus becomes tighter and tighter and there is not enough relaxation for the blood to fill back. Uh, so, this keeps reducing and this is when the fetal distress worsens. There are some markers for fetal distress. The uh, obstetrician monitors the fetal heart rate, they have the CTG tracings and there are uh, different variations. You can refer my videos on fetal monitoring as well. And meconium stain liquor can happen as a surrogate marker. Many times meconium stain liquor happens because of the post maturity, because the baby spontaneously passes stool as their gestation matures. But in fetal distress, you get the meconium stain liquor because the baby has the asphyxial insult and hypoxia causes vagal stimulation and uh, the anal sphincter opens causing meconium passage. So, it is a surrogate marker of asphyxia in some babies. If you have CTG changes with meconium stain liquor, it is more likely it is due to the asphyxia, but if the fetal heart and everything else is normal and the baby is post mature, it could be related to that. So, what happens when <coughs> there is an exposure to this asphyxial insult? So, you have uh, the video on primary and secondary apnea where I have explained the sequence of events and uh, you can review that as well, it is in the NRP playlist and that will explain to you that in the beginning the fetus scopes, there is an increased heart rate and then the baby goes into primary apnea. Uh, the next stage is uh, gasping breathing because the baby is already asphyxiated, the lactate has started accumulating, the acidosis has started, the baby is hypoxic. So, the heart rate starts dropping uh, and then the baby goes into secondary or terminal apnea uh, which over a few minutes if there is no resolution, the baby may die. Uh, and once the baby enters secondary apnea, there is a chance that the blood flow to the brain is uh, reduced and the main impact of the asphyxial insult is going to be on the brain which is irreversible. So, if the asphyxial insult is prolonged and there is no recovery at the timely fashion, then the baby can have damage to the brain. That is the main reason we are worried about asphyxia. There is something called the diving reflex where uh, the blood flow to the vital organs are diverted, uh, depriving some organs like the skin, the muscles and the gut and uh, the blood flow to the heart and the brain is preserved. This is for a certain period of time it can happen and it is called the diving reflex because the seals dive into the cold water and this happens automatically in them to preserve their blood flow. They are going to be swimming for some time underwater before they breathe. So, they have that protective reflex and the same reflex happens in uh, asphyxia as well. You can have abrupt acute total asphyxia due to a cord prolapse or uh, a true knot in the cord or an acute abruption uh, or you can have prolonged asphyxia where the fetus is growth restricted, the placenta is not healthy already and then on top of that you get an asphyxial insult due to prolonged labor and so on. So, acute total asphyxia typically diving reflex does not set in very well and so uh, the brain is most susceptible organ and you may have brain injury without the other organs being affected. If it is prolonged of course, all the organs are affected as well because of the low blood pressure and the low blood flow that happens. So, uh, if the partial prolonged asphyxia happens, then the diving reflex may set in. You may have injury to the kidneys, the liver uh, and other organs, uh, but the heart and the brain tend to be spared in these situations unless it is very severe. The changes that happen to the brain after birth uh, are called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Obviously, the neonatal resuscitation program uh, focuses on avoiding asphyxia, but Asphyxia happens before the baby is born and postnatal resuscitation is important to avoid aggravating it and 
the extent to which the baby needs resuscitation after birth may indicate the severity of the asphyxia. There are some situations where the brain is already damaged uh, due to any neutro stroke or a fetal infection in the womb and so the baby does not cope with the labor process. So, that is a red herring where you think it is birth asphyxia, but actually the brain is already damaged. So, review of the antenatal uh, imaging and immediate postnatal imaging may guide you to say there is something else happening. This is important from the medical legal point of view because birth asphyxia gets blamed on the obstetrician. So, we have to be careful how we communicate with the families, how we share this information because there is a huge risk of litigation and uh, we have to be uh, honest and forthright, but at the same time we have to accept the gaps in the knowledge that we do not know exactly what produced this. So, this is a cycle of events and we can have an onset early on or it can be during the labor process and it does not necessarily reflect on the quality of obstetric care. And this is one area where delayed cord clamping is not uh, still recommended unless you have the option to resuscitate by the mother's side. Uh, you, you have to start the process quickly, follow the NRP guidelines. Uh, if the baby is in secondary apnea, you may consider early intubation and support and if you are needing chest compressions, obviously go for 100 percent oxygen. Because uh, these babies need prolonged resuscitation and these are candidates potentially for cooling, passive cooling is a concept which you need to discuss and you can switch off the warmer if the labor process, I mean if the resuscitation process is prolonged. But at the same time, you need to keep an eye on the baby's temperature. You want the baby to be around 36 degrees. You do not want it to go too low because uh, hypothermia, if it is significant, it can affect your assessment of the baby. The baby becomes uh, hypotonic because of the hypothermia. It may complicate your assessment of the HAE and also the hemodynamic compromise. If the baby is too cold, it can affect your cardiorespiratory adaptation and baby has a risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension. So, passive cooling is a concept where you do not cool the baby to 33 degrees, you cool the baby to 36 degrees, you do not overheat the baby. So, the focus is on avoiding hyperthermia because excessive heating of these babies makes the baby's brain more likely to get injured. So, avoiding hyperthermia is a focus not hypothermia. So, keep this clear in your team. And once the baby comes to the unit, if you feel the baby fulfills the criteria based on the cord blood gas or the blood gas after birth, the presence of an encephalopathy, if you have amplitude integrated EEG, you can use that as well. And if these criteria are fulfilling the like Abgar score, need for resuscitation, the presence of a sentinel event or an obstetric injury, uh, all these are factors which will guide you towards whether the baby needs hypothermia. So, therapeutic hypothermia is a concept in the past 15 years or so, we are using it more and more and in the past 5 years it has become the standard of care in uh, asphyxia. If you have HAE stage 2 and above, you have uh, or moderate encephalopathy and above, you tend to cool the babies. Cooling for mild encephalopathy is not clear cut it. Cooling in premature babies below 34 weeks uh, at or below 34 weeks is not clear cut it. So, uh, therapeutic hypothermia, you can refer the playlist on that as well. The main concern of asphyxia is obviously the risk of sequel. The staging of asphyxia, again, you can refer my previous video on perinatal asphyxia. So, you have uh, mild, moderate or severe and you have Sarnath stages 1, 2 and 3. Stage 2 and 3 increase the risk of sequel. Stage 3 is almost comatose, so very high risk of sequel. If the baby has seizures as well, it puts them at the 2 or above and so there is a risk and uh, obviously, careful supportive management of all the organ systems, proper intensive care without overdoing treatment, therapeutic hypothermia when indicated, proper education and counseling of the family, in, uh, informing of the future risks, MRI at appropriate time usually 5 to 7 days and maybe a repeat MRI in the follow up as well and regular neurodevelopment and follow up are very important. This is just a quick summary of perinatal asphyxia. I hope this is useful. Thank you.